Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest employment club. My name is John Hales. Um, I'm a partner in the employment team here at Wombleborn Dickinson. Um, when I'm not working from home, I'm based in our Southampton office and I'm joined today by Sandy Duncanson, who's a solicitor in our Newcastle office. Um, we decided to choose today as the date for our latest employment club because we were hoping and anticipating that obviously on June the 21st, um, the final stage of unlocking from COVID restrictions would have happened. Um, you'll all be aware that that's now been pushed back until uh, July the 19th, but we're still pressing on with addressing the top 10 issues that we think employers are facing as and when those final COVID restrictions are lifted. And Sandy will be talking to that shortly. Um, I would also pick up one or two bits and pieces which are uh, in the pipeline and also some cases and other recent developments. Um, this is a very fluid time for employment law and guidance coming out of the government quite understandably. And you may have picked up this morning that um, reports are coming out that the government are going to legislate to require um, those operating care homes to ensure that those working on the front line with elderly people are required to take a vaccine. And if they're not vaccinated, they either need to be redeployed or their employment will be terminated. Now, that clearly will be challenging and it's, it's evidence of the, as I said, the fluid nature of what's happening at the moment. So we will, as I said, pick up those top 10 issues that we think employees are facing at the moment. In terms of housekeeping, um, the session will be recorded and we'll distribute a copy of the presentation after the event. Uh, no attendee information will be shared as part of this. You'll see there's a Q&A feature, which should be visible at the top right-hand panel. Um, to expand this, simply uh, click the right-hand arrow and submit your questions. Questions can be submitted throughout the webinar and will be anonymised. We've also had a number of questions already, so what I'll try and do is, is group two or three of them. Um, and cover as much as uh, we can. If the Q&A panel isn't visible, click the panel options button in the bottom right-hand corner, which has three white dots. The Q&A should then be an option at the top and click once to re-enable. In the past, we've run some polls, which we'll also do during this session. These will also be visible in your right-hand panel. Um, and once a poll is launched, you'll have to be quick. You've got 15 seconds to respond and the results will then be shared and anonymized. And so before we move on to Sandy's session, I thought I'd just kick off with an initial poll. Um, and that is um, when the restrictions are lifted, where do you intend to be working? Do you anticipate being in the office all of the time, at home all of the time, or partly in the office and partly at home? And there we are, 84% partly in the office and partly in home. So this concept of hybrid working is obviously what um, and many employers are now having to start grapple with. Indeed, I've got a call with the clients later on this morning around some uh, flexible working requests that uh, that organisation has had and how to deal with those and to implement their hybrid working policy. So we know this is coming and uh, it's coming very quickly. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. So, um, as I said, there will be uh, a couple of other polls during the course of the session, but in the meantime, I'm handing over to Sandy to talk around the top 10 issues that employers we think are now likely to be facing. Sandy. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as John mentioned, the kind of key purpose of this session is to address some of the key employment law implications arising from COVID and more specifically the return to work. I'm going to look at 10 of those issues in today's session um, and you'll see on the screen now that those issues have generally been framed as questions and those are either questions that we've been advising on regularly up to now or whether or questions which we anticipate needing to advise on um, as restrictions are lifted and as that 19th of July date approaches. Um, so I'll launch into the first of our questions which is uh, can we insist on employees working in the office or can they refuse to return? Now, something that I'm probably going to say on more than one occasion here is that we can't be taking a blanket approach in these kinds of situations. I think me saying those exact words might become a bit of a pattern actually in today's session. Um, first of all, 
you should really be trying to find out more about an employee's particular circumstances. Because the employee might have a genuine concern or genuine understandable reason why they might be reluctant to return to the office. And where the employee does have that genuine concern, you should be considering the ways in which you can accommodate that where possible. So, for example, if the employee is generally concerned, uh, sorry, genuinely concerned about their commute, you could suggest alternatives uh, such as you know driving or walking or cycling instead of public transport, or perhaps you could suggest an adjustment to their working pattern to avoid peak travel times, for example, if they're using public transport, and that would hopefully alleviate those concerns and allow them to return to the office happily. That's that's the hope. Um, as far as concerns related to the workplace go, um, the legal position in the Employment Rights Act is that employees can refuse to work if they have a reasonable belief in a serious or imminent danger to their health. And it's unlawful to dismiss an employee uh, or subject them to a detriment uh, where they hold that reasonable belief. So clearly the important piece here is about whether the belief in a serious and imminent danger to health is reasonable. So if the employee is concerned about contracting COVID at work, for example, you should be taking the time to reassure them of the steps that you've taken as a business to make sure that your workplace is safe and COVID secure. And provided that as a business, you've been sensible and you've complied with and followed the, the sector specific guidance that's been issued by the government, that discussion, that explanation that you give will go a long way to stopping the employee's belief in danger to their health from being reasonable. And if following that discussion, the employee still refuses to work, there are still alternatives. Perhaps you could consider whether uh, they can continue to work from home, perhaps on a temporary basis. Um, it might be that in their particular circumstances, for their particular role, there's no real need for them to be in the office. Um, in, in general, I would say that it's always best to resolve these situations amicably, if possible, where these kinds of matters descend into a dispute. Um, there's always a risk of the employee feeling like they need to resign, potentially looking to bring claims of constructive unfair dismissal, etc. So if we can resolve it amicably, we should be looking to do so. Um, but after all that, having said all of that, if you genuinely need them to be in the office, and working from home is not possible, and you do not believe that they have a reasonable belief in a serious and imminent danger to their health, then you can potentially take disciplinary action and ultimately consider dismissal. Now, as I said, I... Sector specific guidance and your workplace is COVID secure, and you've explained that in detail, it's going to be difficult for them to establish that reasonable belief that would be necessary for them to succeed in an employment tribunal claim. But just one final point on this one is that in any event, decisions that you're taking that relate to this should be carefully documented, and that includes where the employee in question has less than two years' service, because the right that I've referred to uh, multiple times. That that applies regardless of length of service. So whatever you're doing, make sure that you're carefully documenting the decisions that you make here. Uh, moving on to our second question is whether we can ask staff, what, ask if staff have been vaccinated. Um, this is, as you'll see on, on the screen there, this is the first of a few vaccination related topics that we're going to cover today. It, it's clearly a hot button issue right now. Millions of people are signing up to be vaccinated every week, which is excellent. Um, to specifically respond to this one, asking about vaccination does create challenges from a data protection perspective. The mere fact that somebody has received a vaccine or not will in and of itself constitute um, a special category of data uh, which concerns health. So you need to consider uh, that asking whether, well, you also need to consider that asking whether the employee has been vaccinated you're not just asking that question as a closed question. You might also be impliedly asking whether the employee suffers from any health concerns, which might be pre preventing them from being vaccinated. Or alternatively, if you do ask whether an employee has been vaccinated and they say no, you might want to say why, at which point they might be sharing more unnecessary medical data, which you have no real reason to process from a data protection perspective. So, Whatever the circumstances, 
wh whenever you're dealing with special category of data, you need to have a legitimate interest for processing it. And you would need to show that retaining such data is necessary. Um, from that data protection perspective, the ICO have actually published guidance on for employers on collecting vaccination data and when it might be justified. So clearly it's easier to justify collecting vaccination data in certain workplaces. So for example, if you operate your business in a health and care setting where COVID prevent, uh, presents a really specific risk to your business, then you might be able to say that you have a legitimate interest to collect that vaccination data. But otherwise, I would say that asking about vaccination is best avoided. Now, I will also say that where your intention behind asking about vaccination is to monitor levels of vaccination across the workplace, rather, th rather than to inquire about one specific individual, you might want to consider keeping your records anonymous. Um, but again, that's only for businesses that, ha that are able to demonstrate a compelling reason for collecting the data in the first place. So for example, in the health and care setting. Um, so I've answered that question as it relates to current employees, but what about prospective employees as well? I read an article recently about a business who shall, re shall remain nameless for the purposes of this uh, session, but they've issued job adverts, which has vaccination against coronavirus as a requirement. And uh, that also raises a number of concerns. Not only do we face the same data protection concerns, ask, you know, asking about vaccinations as I've already outlined, but a requirement for vaccination in that way will put that business at a risk of discrimination claims. So for example, where an individual might not have been vaccinated due to their age, you know, I've not been vaccinated twice due to my age, for example, or perhaps due to something arising in consequence of their disability. Um, and just in general, as, as I'm sure we all know, the recruitment process is one individual more favorably than others on the basis that you're offering them a role within your organization. And when you're doing that, having made inquiries that are vaccination related, you are opening yourself up to allegations of discrimination. So again, I think it's best avoided. Um, clearly, this business that I've spoken about here that that were appeared in that article, clearly they believe that um, they can defend any discrimination allegations on the basis that it's a justifiable requirement to have that in their job adverts. Um, so they might say, well, we need to have it in there to protect the health and safety of our clients, the health and safety of our employees. But it is worth mentioning that where that same aim could be achieved through less intrusive means, such as mask wearing, testing, which I'll come on to, then to have that requirement as part of a job advert might just might not be justifiable. Um, moving on to our third question, which is whether we could make vaccinations mandatory. Now, John's touched on this already. There was uh, a, a report in the BBC this morning, which I'll come on to, about mandatory vaccinations in the uh, care sector. Um, in general, just before I come on to that article, in general, my view is that mandatory vaccinations are a fairly high risk approach. And it would be difficult to enforce uh, a policy of mandatory vaccinations without risking claims of discrimination, which, as we've said, could be based on disability, could be based on age, could be based on pregnancy and maternity, for example, uh, or possibly claims for unfair dismissal if the situation was to escalate um, to that point. Um, the ACAS advice on mandatory vaccinations as it is at the moment is to support employees to have vaccinations. And that means, for example, paying them to have time off to get vaccinated, uh, paying them for sick leave that might result uh, from the vaccination side effects, etc. cetera, um, but not to force them to have it. And the Equality and Human Rights Commission has also commented that a policy of compulsory vaccinations widespread policy such as that is unlikely to be lawful. And in general, I would say that a, a supportive approach to vaccination, a supportive attitude is, first of all, much safer from a legal perspective for the reasons I've given. But you might also find that it might end up being more productive. Um, now, in some cases, though, having a vaccination might be necessary to do the job. Um, and I'll come on to this article now that, that was published this morning, which is 
in relation to the care sector. So it was an article in uh, BBC News is where I saw it. Um, and the background to this is that the government issued a consultation earlier in the year around the issue of making vaccination a condition of deployment in older adult care homes. Um, and the BBC report this morning has suggested that they will be looking to make it compulsory, as John has, as John has said, with uh, subject to medical exemptions. And we're expected to, to, to receive a government announcement on that point within the next few days. So we'll, we'll look out for that. And following that, you know, clearly, as John said, this is an area of the law which is flowing incredibly quickly and developing and changing. So we'll kind of take stock of of that announcement once made and kind of evaluate the implications across the wider landscape. Uh, moving on to our fourth question now, which is um, what can we do if an employee refuses to work with a colleague who has not been vaccinated? Now, again, this is a situation where you can't be taking a blanket approach. Um, each employee's circumstances will, as always, be different. And while one's refusal to work might be utterly ridiculous, someone else's might be completely justified. So to that end, you should be speaking to the employee in question. You should be finding out what their concerns are. For example, are they worried about perhaps a vulnerable relative at home that they could pass COVID to? Are they worried that social distancing measures aren't being followed in the workplace by a specific individual? Um, do they think that individual has COVID and hasn't reported it? Um, or alternatively, is this issue not related to COVID in the slightest, but that just acts as a convenient excuse to mask a kind of personality clash? That could well be the reason as well. Um, as always, if the employee has a genuine concern, I'd suggest that you take steps to try and resolve it. So that might involve taking practical action. So putting extra safety measures in place, for example, or reminding other employees, including the employee complained of, that, of what they need to do in order to keep people safe at work. Alternatively, if you can't resolve the matter in that way, you might want to look at whether the employee who has complained um, might be able to work from home temporarily. On the other hand, if the employee doesn't have a genuine concern at all, but nonetheless refuses to work on, you know, clinging on to this basis that uh, other colleagues have not been vaccinated and aren't keeping them safe, you may need to take disciplinary action uh, on the basis that they're refusing to comply with the reasonable management instruction. Um, but this does link back to our first topic, which was uh, employees returning, uh, refusing to return to the office. And this point that I made about if an employee has a reasonable belief that they're in serious and imminent danger to their health, you should avoid dismissing them and subjecting them to a detriment. So again, our key objectives with this issue, as well as with the first, are to ensure that the belief is not a reasonable one, do everything that we can, present everything we can to the employee to make sure that their belief is not reasonably held, and then carefully document any disciplinary action that we might uh, end up deciding to take. I'll move on to our fifth question now, and I'm actually going to kick this one off at, with by running our second poll. So our poll question here is whether you ask employees to take regular coronavirus tests, and it's just a yes or no question. Um, so we're not asking whether you impose a mandatory COVID test or just whether you ask employees to take regular tests. Yes or no. OK, so fairly even results there. Um, our workplace does ask us to take COVID tests before attending the office, in case anybody was wondering. Um, but it's not mandatory. Now, if you are a customer facing business uh, with no real scope for staff to work from home, then you may have a sound reason for requiring employees to be tested regularly. So not just asking them, but making it a mandatory requirement. But if you are considering that, if you're considering implementing mandatory testing, you need to carry out, first of all, a risk assessment. And that will take account of the workplace circumstances, the risks of transmission, you know, whether this is actually legitimately necessary based on data. And you should then consider introducing a testing policy if you do consider mandatory tests to be appropriate, because that policy will document the process behind testing, the process behind receiving results, what to do when an employee receives a positive result, 
uh, absence required when an employee has a positive result, et cetera. And if an employee refuses to be tested, which, which can happen, but again, this is a case of you needing to investigate the reasons behind that refusal. It's important for you to be flexible and try to demonstrate reasonableness in these kinds of situations. And you can do that by finding a way to resolve issues like this amicably. Again, that's becoming a pattern of things that I'm saying today. Um, it might be, for example, that employees are concerned about testing because they're concerned about being sent home to self-isolate uh, for 10 days following a positive test, and that might you know, cause them to lose income. And clearly lateral flow tests are not as reliable as tests through the NHS, for example, and that might give people some, some cause for concern. Now, on that basis, you might consider, okay, how, you know, how can we resolve that amicably? Well, it might be appropriate to make changes to the way that you deal with COVID-related absence. So, for example, you could say that following a positive test, um, you might not count the, the, the COVID-related absence in an employee's absence record. And that's particularly for those of you who operate a trigger system of absence management. You might say, okay, well, if you have a COVID test and you have to self-isolate for 10 days, we won't count that towards our absence triggers, for example. Uh, or alternatively, you might wish to um, pay staff at their normal rate of pay following for absences following a positive test rather than uh, at the rate of SSP. Uh, either of those options uh, might make a system of mandatory vaccination an easier pill for a reluctant employee to swallow. Having said all that, uh, if the employee's refusal to be tested is without justification, and if you feel that they're putting others at risk, then depending on the circumstances, it might be reasonable for you to take disciplinary action. Um, now, as ever, I'll give a generic disclaimer that if disciplinary action does result in dismissal, um, you know, you could face the risk of an unfair dismissal claim unless you have a clear documented reason for dismissal and you followed a fair procedure. But in any event, whether you as a business feel uh, able to implement mandatory testing or not, you should consider encouraging employees to undertake home testing as an alternative. Uh, and if they test positive, clearly they should avoid attending work. And perhaps get an NHS test to either confirm the lateral flow test or to disagree with him. Um, finally, I will just make a quick note about data protection concerns um, which relate to testing. Now, I mentioned earlier that the ICO have uh, issued guidance on collecting vaccination data. They've actually also issued guidance for employers on uh, data relating to testing. And what they've said is that the mere testing of an employee to test whether or not they have COVID or not, uh, that is an act of collecting data relating to health, which comes under that specific specialized category of data, which requires additional safeguards. So that's something to be wary of um, wherever there's testing in the workplace, whether it's mandatory or otherwise. Um, okay, I'll move on to the next slide quickly. Okay, so. Our sixth question is whether we need to update contracts to reflect hybrid working. Uh, so John's poll earlier was quite overwhelming in, in terms of the amount of people on this call who consider that they will be working in some kind of hybrid arrangement post COVID. So not at home all the time, not in the office all the time, but hybrid, some kind of hybrid between the two. And that aligns with, uh, the, the poll that we've done today aligns with wider research that I've seen on this topic uh, by YouGov, you know, YouGov polls, for example, which indicate that the majority of people will want to continue to work from home at least some of the time. So uh, what's the, what are the practical implications of this and, and specifically in relation to, to contracts? If hybrid working is going to be a permanent arrangement and it's going to apply to all staff, you could consider looking to update your standard form contract of employment that you would use for new employees uh, to cover the practical consequences. One of the most obvious changes will be to the normal place of work. Uh, so, for example, if you have an employee who works permanently from home, then their home, then their home address will normally be their workplace within their contract of employment. Um, and you might also consider that there should be changes to hours of work or working patterns within uh, the employment contract. Pre-pandemic, your standard form employment contract might have stated that employees work 37 and a half hours a week, 
between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, you might find that that's no longer an accurate reflection of the way in which your business works. It's no longer an accurate reflection of your expectations as an employer now that we're entering this hybrid working era. Um, other practical changes will probably include salary and benefits, uh, expenses, confidentiality and data protection issues that might arise from people being at home more often. Um, and in any event, I will say that if you are updating your standard form uh, contract, you should retain the right, regardless of how often the, the employee is going to be at home as part of any hybrid arrangement, you should retain the right to require them to attend the office if necessary. Now, that's in relation to kind of standard form contract and future employees. In relation to existing employees, I think it might be better to adopt a bit of a wait and see approach before we make any real changes. I think it's a safe assumption that the landscape of hybrid working is going to continue to change. It's going to continue to develop over time. And we expect that working patterns will shift naturally. You know, some employees will gradually increase the amount of time that they uh, that they that they work in the office. And so we should probably give it time for the hybrid working era to establish itself and for these things to settle before we start making changes to existing contracts of employment. We don't want to jump the gun with those changes. Changes of terms and conditions, as, as I'm sure everybody knows, require consultation with and the consent of those affected employees. So it's not really something that you want to be doing more than once if you, you know, if, if you can avoid it. Now, rather than updating existing contracts at the moment, as an alternative, you might want to consider either updating or adapting an existing flexible working policy to specifically refer to and include hybrid working uh, if that policy is non-contractual and can be amended at any time. Uh, or alternatively, you could introduce a brand new standalone hybrid working policy. A policy of that kind, it would clarify eligibility for hybrid working. It would set out how you as an employer expect that arrangement to work. Um, it would set out how hybrid working will intersect with other forms of flexible working within your business. Um, so provided that policy is non-contractual, as I said, um, that will give you the opportunity to review your hybrid working arrangements as the, situ as the situation develops and make changes as required in a way that you can't necessarily do with people's terms and conditions. Um, and just finally, from a policy perspective, I mentioned some of the wider implications to the employment contract. You might also wish to review the other policies that will relate even tangentially to hybrid working. So that might include expenses policies, IT usage policies, home working policies, data protection policies. Um, and we can obviously advise on those kinds of cross policy implications as well. Moving on to question number seven then. Um, how should we handle flexible working requests from staff who have worked at home during the pandemic? This is a really interesting one. Um, briefly, the legal position, as I'm sure most of you know, employees with at least 26 weeks service uh, have the right to make a flexible working request up to once per year to permanently change their T's and C's. Um, and flexible working requests can relate to hours of work, times of work, or uh, the place in which the employee works. Now, as I'm sure you know, employers can reject a flexible working request for one of one or more of eight specified reasons, uh, including a burden of costs, a detrimental impact on performance or on quality, or a detrimental effect on the business's ability to meet customer demand, which I think might be one that is relied on quite often in these kinds of cases. In any event, you'll need to consider the request properly. Um, and discuss it with the employee to see how the requested flexible working pattern could be implemented. If you're reluctant to implement uh, kind of wholesale flexible working requests, it, it's going to be more difficult, I think, to reject requests where the employee has worked from home for us, you know, for a long period of time during the pandemic, where those arrangements have worked well where no concerns have been raised, where there's been no impact on service delivery, it will be challenging to reject those requests. Refusals could, of course, lead to discrimination claims, for example, uh, you know, a, a request brought by a, a female employee who, you know, with caring responsibilities. So we need to be aware of those implications as well. Um, however, 
it's not a lost cause because it might be that the employee's ability to work from home for the past year or however long isn't necessarily reflective of their ability to work from home effectively in the future. It might be, for example, that for the last year or so, your employees have been able to work well from home on the basis that your customer base has also been at home. But when your customer base is not at home, that you don't think they'll be able to effectively work from home. Um, you don't think that your employees will be able to continue to effectively work from home from that point onwards. Um, so where you do have employees who have historically been required to attend the office pre-pandemic, and you anticipate that that requirement is going to return post-pandemic, you need to be able to explain in detail why you believe that to be the case. And as always, keep a comprehensive written record of your deliberations and any decision. Uh, moving on to question number eight here, which is whether we can stop employees going on holiday to amber list countries. Um, so as we all know, the government has implemented the, the red, amber, green system uh, to regulate travel during the pandemic. Uh, and it's not currently illegal to travel to an amber list country, but the government is discouraging travel to those countries for leisure purposes. Um, in theory, you could uh, implement a policy of preventing employees from, from traveling to amber list countries, but it will be challenging to keep track of where an employee is planning to travel to. Uh, a policy like that is likely to make employees, I think, reluctant to disclose that kind of information or even to be dishonest about it, frankly. Um, or on the other hand, I, I can envisage a situation where an employee um, books a holiday or books their annual leave, tells you that they're going to a green list country, you approve it on that basis, but then the country is moved to the amber list the week before their departure. So it's very difficult to, to kind of keep track and regulate a policy like that. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the legal position, uh, the employer does have some leverage under the working time regulations. So you can stop an employee from taking holiday by serving notice on them under regulation 15.2b of the working time regs. And that notice must identify the dates on which the employee cannot take annual leave that they've booked. And it must give at least the same number of, the notice must be given at least the same number of days in advance uh, as the number of days that are being canceled. So if, if it's seven days to be canceled, the notice must be given seven days in advance. Um, but it's worth noting that where this uh, kind of notice is given fairly last minute and an employee has, on reliance of an initial approval of a holiday request, actually booked flights, for example, flights in a hotel, they might expect you to compensate them for, you know, for, the, for that inconvenience. So you'll need a very good reason to cancel annual leave in that way. And really, you should be offering alternative dates as well. So for me, a better way to proceed and to manage this issue is to make clear that where an employee is traveling to an amber list country, unless they can work from home for the compulsory quarantine period, which would make things a lot easier, that they have to take holiday to cover that quarantine period or that they have to take un unpaid leave to cover that holiday period. And if you go down that route, it should be consistently applied you know, across your workforce. Um, finally, uh, on this point, just in relation to returning from amber list countries and quarantine, uh, it should be noted that where an employee is required to self-isolate or required to quarantine, uh, it's a legal requirement that they must inform their employer and the employer must not allow the employee to attend anywhere other than the place designated for self-isolation or quarantine, which is normally the employee's home. They cannot attend the workplace or they cannot attend anywhere for any purpose in relation to their employment. And if that does happen persistently, employers can be fined for breach up to £10,000. So it's important that if you do have someone returning from, that, from an amber list country, that you do have them stick to those quarantine requirements because it really could come back on you as an employer uh, from a financial sense. Uh, question nine then is in relation to long COVID, employees have been diagnosed with long COVID and their symptoms come and go. Um, so as we all know, long COVID is essentially when people suffer from ill health for an extended period of time after having had uh, coronavirus. And the trouble with long COVID is that it seems to affect different people in different ways. <laughs> I was doing some reading about it this morning and the list of symptoms is as long as my arm, 
and remarkably varied, you know, from breathlessness, heart problems, to lack of concentration, to exhaustion. It's remarkably varied. Um, and clearly some of, uh, if not all of those symptoms that I've just mentioned could have a detrimental impact on someone's ability to, you know, to do their work. Um, so the first consideration with long COVID, as it is with any seemingly long-term condition, is whether it can amount to a disability. Now, whether an employee is disabled because of long COVID will depend on their particular circumstances, but the legal position is that a person is disabled under the Equality Act if they have a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on their ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities. And by long term, we mean that the impairment has, has lasted for, or it is anticipated to last for at least 12 months. And it's certainly possible then that in more serious cases, long COVID may well be classified as being a disability. Now, if disabled, an employee with long COVID will have the right not to be discriminated against, not to be subjected to a detriment because of that disability, and you, the employer, will be under the duty to make reasonable adjustments. Um, I will make a couple of quick points about discrimination cases, which is that there's no cap on, uh, on compensation in those cases, and there is no qualifying period of service required to bring a claim. So to that end, where an employee has long COVID and you consider that it's possible that it could amount to a disability, you should be discussing with that employee how they're feeling, the specific effect that their symptoms, their individual symptoms have on them, and what measures might be it, you might be able to put in place to help them manage their workload. And you should also consider making a referral to occupational health uh, or contacting the employee's GP. It's always best, in my view, to make informed decisions about an employee's medical condition when you're armed with an up-to-date medical opinion, uh, particularly with something like long COVID, which is clearly fairly new and uh, we're not overly familiar with you know with the effects with the symptoms now following that discussion with the employee you may need to make reasonable adjustments as i've alluded to so that could include changing working hours uh, offering more flexibility in working hours and working pattern um, offering a phased return to work if an employee is, has been off on long-term sick um, or allowing an employee to work from home more often than some of your other employees, for example. Um, if the symptoms are intermittent, if they come and go, as, as the question on the slide um, suggests, um, you might be able to adjust the, the employee's working pattern around that. So, for example, in a similar way as you might treat uh, an employee who has chronic fatigue or suffers from fibromyalgia, which are also conditions, as I understand it, where the symptoms can come or go. Um, as I say, there, there might be an ability to, to offer, offer some flexibility in relation to that working pattern. Um, on the other hand, the medical advice might be that the employee is to remain signed off sick um, until they've fully recovered. Uh, finally, I'll make a suggestion in relation to employee assistance programs. I'm sure some of you on this uh, session today do operate employee assistance programs, and these will hopefully be able to support an employee in that situation. Uh, I can imagine that suffering from long COVID is a pretty horrible experience, um, particularly given how little is really known about it at, at this point. So really, we should be doing everything we can to try and support employees who are in that situation. Um, our final question then is, and it's not a particularly happy note to end on, but it's the question of what to do if an employee discloses that they have suffered from depression and anxiety during the pandemic. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll refer back to the definition of disability that I've just given. Um, clearly depression and anxiety is an impairment which could potentially amount to a disability depending on uh, its severity and whether it has lasted or is likely to last for 12 months. Um, if so, you'll need to consider what reasonable adjustments you can make. And that could be changing working hours. It could be allowing the employee to work in the office if they feel isolated, uh, you know, to be able to be around people and speak to people. You know, they might feel that that's helpful. In general, you should just be discussing with the employee how they're coping, the impact uh, of how they're feeling on their work and what you can do to help them and then make adjustments in the context of that conversation. 
Uh, and you should also consider other support such as uh, employee assistance programs, uh, as I mentioned before, and perhaps regular catch ups with colleagues, with supervisors, wh whomever it might be. Um, and finally, again, as I mentioned when I was speaking about long COVID, obtaining an up to date medical report is often a very good idea. It, it can advise on, it can give a medical opinion on the employee's condition and it can make some, uh, it, it can give advice on what adjustments might assist them. Because as a reminder, the duty to make reasonable adjustments is on you as the employer. It's not on the employee to proactively suggest things in the form of a discussion. So for you as an employer to go out, obtain a medical report, ask a medical professional what adjustments could possibly be made, that will put you in the best position to say that you've made all adjustments that would be reasonable. Um, now, I know that some of you had uh, submitted questions in advance of the session, which hopefully some, you know, hopefully some of them have been covered in what we've spoken about already. But uh, we do have the opportunity now to answer a couple more specific questions, John. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I've been tracking the Q and A and linking it with some comments and questions we had at the start. You touched on um, travel abroad. We've had a couple of comments and questions around traveling abroad for work in normal circumstances of those that have to travel overseas. Mm -hmm. But what about if somebody doesn't actually want to be vaccinated, but still wants to travel? Any thoughts on the best way of dealing with that? If the employer thinks it's a bit risky. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one. I I'll be honest, I'm hopeful that this isn't an issue which will arise too commonly in practice because the travel advice for, you know, the relevant country will hopefully say that there will be restrictions that apply, you know, depending on the country that the employee is traveling to. And I would hope that countries of concern will remain on red and amber lists and other countries might well require, you know, proof of vaccination to travel, for example. So it might be that that employee ends up being prevented from traveling, not because of any action of the employer, but just because of the general uh, actions of the airline or of the government of the de of the of the destination uh, country. Um, it, in terms of w whether you could prevent an employee from traveling and kind of the basis on doing that, well, clearly employers do have uh, a duty to protect health and safety. Um, so if there's a judgment made that the risks of an employee traveling to a certain country uh, are too high, then you could potentially stop them from traveling on that basis. But I would advise that we, that, and again, I've said this often today, but we keep a good written record of our reasons for doing that. So for example, it might be a new variant has been discovered in this destination country, and this is the reason why we're gonna prevent you from traveling. Um, and just as a final point on that, I, I, I've touched on this already, but where there's travel, whether it's travel for work or, or, or travel for leisure, always need to consider the uh, practical implica implications of quarantine on return. Um, that might be easier for some employees rather than others. So those employees that can work from home easily, it might not you know, cause too much disruption in the workplace. But um, I do know as well that the government has published some guidance on gov.uk around job roles that can qualify for exemption from those travel and quarantine restrictions as well. So that's something for people to keep an eye on. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um... And finally, a few bits and pieces and comments around holiday. Now, I know you're off on Friday, partly to prepare for watching the football, I know. Uh, <laughs> but for many employers, holidays backing up. There's lots of people with lots of accrued holidays. So quite a simple question. Can we make employees take all their holiday this year? Hmm. That's, a, that is a, that's a good question because we, we answered that question a lot last year. In the midst of lockdown, it was one of the questions I think I received the most, frankly. But it is still relevant, isn't it? You know, on the basis that there are continuing restrictions on travel, just because we're not in lockdown, we are still, you know, in continuing restrictions on travel. I mean, I've not taken hol holiday since Christmas, practically, until Friday, as you say. So um, going back to that advice last year, then, what we what we what we said or what we advised a lot of employers on was the process of asking employees to take a proportion of holiday entitlement by a certain point of the year. So for example, if you have a holiday year that runs from January to December, you could ask employees to take 50% of their holiday entitlement between January and June or three quarters by the end of September, you know, something along those lines. Um, and that, that a policy in that way will ensure that employees don't end up with a massive amount of accrued holiday at the end of the year. Um, However, 
it should be said that a blanket policy like that can't necessarily be enforced unless there is a relevant contractual provision. Um, but my, what I always go back to in terms of the position on holidays, this is one of the one of the ways in which the the employee really has employer sorry has leverage here under the working time regs. So I referred to the working time regs before in relation to cancelling holiday, but under the under the regs, an employer can also require employees to take holiday on specific dates by giving twice as much notice as the amount of time that the employee is required to take off. So for example, if it's seven days off, it would be 14 days notice and the employer can require that the employee take holiday on those dates and that's a legal right. And that absolutely would prevent people from accruing holiday um, by the end of the year. And I suppose I, I, I often make this point in relation to the regs and holiday in general, the purpose of the regs and, and is to ensure that people take proper breaks from work and to safeguard people's health and safety. Uh, preventing employees from going months and months without taking holiday isn't a bad thing. It's it, it's actually helpful for them as well as you know as well as it is for the employer. It's it's helping them to take time off to have proper rest breaks. Um, so I always mention that whenever I'm asked about holiday. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Okay, I'm going to move on to recent cases and what's in the pipeline now. Um, the first uh, case I want to touch on is a Tupi related case. Um, and that's as to whether or not employees can transfer to multiple transferees, whether it's a service provision change. Now, um, I've worked with a number of you on this webinar in the past in relation to these types of issues. And if I'm being brutally honest, I spent many years advising that where you can't identify the transferee because the, the contract may be split, um, you're unlikely to be in Tupi territory. You're more likely to be facing a redundancy situation. Um, and this is you know, a very quickly evolving area of law and, and is actually quite challenging. So we had a, a European case not so long ago, which basically held that um, you could have uh, a transfer from one existing provider to multiple service providers. And that raised a few eyebrows. And for those of us that advise in this area quite a lot, think, well, how's that going to work in practice? It was a European case, and it was a case which was what I would call a business transfer. So as you may know that in Europe, there is not the concept that we have in the UK of service provision change. So the question was, well, in a service provision change context, would this still apply? And the cases I've mentioned there, McTeer and Mighty, were cases involving uh, an existing transferer, Amy Services, had a contract with North Lanarkshire Council. And what they did was they went in and replaced all the kitchens in the council's social housing stock. Employees were split into two teams and they worked independently. Council retendered, as happens quite regularly, and they split the contract into two areas. One contract was awarded to McTeer, one to Mighty. Issue then, was it Tupi or was it redundancy? Now, historically, if I'd have been advising on this two, three years ago, I'd have probably said, well, you can't really cherry pick which employees go where. So it probably wasn't a Tupi situation. And in this case, that was the view that McTeer and Mighty took. They did not accept that Tupi applied and therefore the employees didn't transfer across and ended up bringing claims. So this came to the employment tribunal. Ultimately, the employment tribunal found that following a service provision change, employees can hold two or more contracts of employment with different employers at the same time. Now, this is challenging in terms of how this is going to be worked in practice. Um, clearly, transfer alls, that's the outgoing employer, will need to decide which employees go to which contractor. Employees are potentially going to find themselves with two part-time contracts of employment with all the challenges that and complication that brings around holidays, benefits and working time. So what I would say is this is a complicated area. This is a big change. So those of you that are dealing with Tupi issues, please do um, look at this, these cases carefully. And in these circumstances, I think you will need to take advice because you know, you're often not dealing with a small number of employees in these circumstances. You're often dealing with significant numbers of employees and therefore you know, it's gonna be a challenging issue to deal with. So I wanted to mention this case because I think it is gonna have big implications moving forward. 
Um, the second case I wanted to touch on was Pamant against Renewi. Um, and this related to random drugs and alcohol testing policies. And I just thought I'd run through the facts of this case and then we'll do a quick poll. So be ready for that. Um, Mr. Pamant worked for Renewi as a driver. He'd been there since 2010. The company had a policy. Anybody who failed a drugs test would be dismissed if they didn't resign. Mr. Pamant injured his back and suffered from chronic and acute back pain. Signed off for six months, unfit for work. Medication prescribed by his GP didn't really help. So occasionally he took cannabis to help with the pain and help him sleep. He didn't take it for recreational purposes. Two months after he returned to work, he undertook a random drugs test, tested non-negative for cannabis. He was invited to a disciplinary and ultimately summarily dismissed for gross misconduct. The reason was that he had a tested non-negative, brought a claim in the tribunal for unfair dismissal. So our final poll, simple question, was Mr. Pamant unfairly dismissed? Yes or no? A straightforward unfair dismissal claim. Tribunal had to decide, was he unfairly dismissed? Yes or no? So 55% think yes, nearly 30% think no. Um, tribunal found unfair dismissal. It was outside the range of reasonable responses and therefore unfair for a number of reasons. And I just thought I just want to pick out one or two of the, the key reasons that the tribunal took into account in reaching that decision. Um, they found the employer had not taken account of his genuine reason for taking the cannabis. He had an unblemished service record. And in fact, there were no concerns when he came back to work about his performance. Um, the employer decided the conduct amounted to gross misconduct without any assessment of those wider circumstances. I don't think the tribunal liked the policy, which that if you failed a drugs test, you'd be dismissed if you didn't resign. Employer argued that it was a health and safety risk, but tribunals thought that, that was irrelevant because he worked mainly as a driver's mate um, and did not actually drive the vehicles. And interestingly, the company's health and well-being policy said somebody with substance abuse, they would, their main focus as an employer would be to concentrate on rehabilitation, which the tribunal felt should have been the case here. So for all those reasons, um, they found it was unfair and interestingly ordered reinstatement, which we don't always see. Obviously, most unfair dismissal cases lead to an award of compensation. Um, this was reinstatement and ultimately he was reinstated because he'd not been replaced and there was still work that he could do. So it's an interesting case. It's just a reminder that some of these will be tricky to deal with. Um, it's only an employment tribunal decision. So, you know, it's first instance, but I wanted to raise it because, and as the poll result indicated, people will have different views on how they might deal with that. So again, something just to be alive to. Finally, just to wrap up um, in terms of what's in the pipeline coming through. So 2021, you'll see there on the slides, um, 20th of June, the concession on right to work check ends. At the moment, um, new recruits can scan documents, video calls from 21st of June. We're back to face to face and physical document checks. Um, 30th of June, this is the deadline for EU, EEA and Swiss citizens to um, apply for EU settlement scheme to continue living in the UK after the end of June. Um, and from the 1st, uh, those citizens will need to provide evidence of lawful immigration and won't be able to continue using passport or national identity cards. Um, increase in the amount that employers have to start paying towards wages under the furlough scheme. Um, you'll see the 10% on 1st July, 20% on 1st of August. You'll have sensed quite a lot of commentary and political debate going on with the um, pushback of the final relaxation of stage four till the 19th of July. But you know, at the moment, the, those increased amounts towards wages are in place. Um, and by the 5th of October, that's the date for the um, uh, gender pay gap reporting. They were pushed back from March um, and April earlier this year. Um, so those that date's been pushed back to the 5th of October. In terms of what's in the pipeline from 2022, 
formal review of the gender pay gap legislation that's due to come through um further introduction of an elite based points system visa system by march 22 and the thought about a new global business mobility visa again there's lots going on around the business immigration space we're doing an increasing amount of advice for clients in that area because of these changes that are coming through um changes possibly to the powers and funding of the certification officers of those you deal with trade union issues um and a new right to neonatal leave and 12 weeks pay is expected to be introduced early in 2023 um lots around looking at um amendments to the flexible working regulations lots of commentary around gig economy workers and the possibility of a draft employment bill um, and the extension of redundancy protection to be given to mothers on maternity leave so that that protection would apply both to those pregnant women and for six months after a mother returns to work and similar protection for those taking adoption and shared parental leave and again a lot of these um issues are as i said it's still up for debate in terms of what we're coming through but these are the types of things that are being um discussed as are proposals around large employers to publish parental leave and pay policies and other pay gap uh, documentation and finally if if you didn't see a couple of weeks ago paul scully who's a minister within the relevant government department listed various proposals which the government are looking at um, a number around whistleblowing review another employment bill but interesting they're looking quite closely at what is described as fire and rehire guidance which as obviously you're all um, legal or hr professionals in this space this is the concept obviously of dismissing and re-engaging an employee on new terms and conditions colloquially fire and rehire guidance so there's been lots of political commentary on whether that should continue to be allowed and in those circumstances what um, an employer should or should not be doing uh, when they're thinking about that type of uh, restructuring uh, but no time scale was given in respect of that so that's a, a, a quick heads up in terms of um, what's being considered by government moving forward obviously timing is subject to other issues around COVID-19 and, and, and other things which the government may or may not need to prioritize um, just looking at anything that's come through actually somebody has mentioned a point around the 20th of June point so will any of the measures that are in the pipeline further delayed uh, it's a good point and actually i mentioned there those uh the concession on in-person right to work checks that was due to end on 20th of june um i suspect what we may find is as the guidance has not changed around people working from home if they can do so that's not changed and that will remain in face to the 19th of july i would expect that that concession might be extended up until that date because in theory the position will not be changing from next week in terms of people working from home if they can do so that's probably one to watch um so that's probably it from us thank you for joining us today i hope you found it helpful um if you have any follow-up questions as what's been covered please let us know and contact um one of the team that you regularly uh, will work with um, you'll see a short feedback questionnaire um, when you exit the webinar very helpful for us if you get two minutes just to complete it that would be great um, we have a couple of um, events coming up shortly um, managing a multi-generational workforce um, you'll find further details of that on our website that's on tuesday the 29th of june um, and you won't have had an invitation yet for it but we have scheduled our next employment club for thursday the 16th of uh, september so we hope uh, you'll be able to join us then but uh, in the meantime from me and from sandy thank you very much for joining us today thank you